Good afternoon, class. Uh, welcome back. I'm going to make a few comments here to round out our week, our first week together. I hope you're doing well and feeling like <clears throat> the class is starting to take on a little momentum and feeling a little more familiar than maybe it did earlier on in the week. Anyway, we're talking today about the Mongol Empire. Um, in some ways, this last couple of days, we've been talking about the Mongols not just as a phenomenon in Chinese uh, history, but also in, in world history as a whole, because the Mongols were, for a brief period of time, a decisive force and presence <clears throat> in the world, uh, both within China and beyond. So, start off with our objectives. You're probably becoming very familiar with these, so we're going to move on through those. I highlighted some of these uh, slides um, in part yesterday and then a little more today. Um, we left off talking about Mongol power and governance and we talked about how <clears throat> really in many respects the way in which the Mongol military was put together, the incentives and the way that Mongol warriors and Mongol leaders went about their business of consolidating their power, it really required that they continue to conquer and continue to um, meet and engage on the battlefield because as we've learned in other parts during other places of world uh, history um, a host of bored underemployed soldiers is rarely a good thing so the mongols kept moving and that was both part of what made them so strong and powerful but it's also going to be part of what create some problems as the Mongols seek to consolidate their gains and settle in and become something closer to a civilization once they start to take over China. So one of the things I didn't get to on this slide before we left uh, off today was that one of the things that the Mongols did pretty well, and this is for sort of for our second objective um, where we're talking about how they sought to administer and manage uh, China. Uh, once they took over starting in 1260 to 1279. But one of the institutions that they use is called the, Dara, the Dar, Darugachi. And the Darugachi was essentially a governor that the Mongols would put in place after they conquered a new region or a new uh, part of their growing empire. And this is interesting because the Darugachi is really in some ways a show of tolerance that the Mongols demonstrated uh, relative to their uh, conquered enemies. And essentially the Darugachi, all he did, his main responsibility was collecting taxes. And so if the Mongols could collect taxes from a newly conquered area, they were more or less satisfied. They didn't seek to transform or uh, you know, dismantle the culture that had taken place there. They oftentimes allowed their conquered subjects to continue to practice whatever religion it was that they practiced before. Uh, the real important issue here, again, was just taxes. And the Darugachi had quite a bit of uh, latitude or leeway in terms of how he went about collecting those taxes. It was not a uniform system. Uh, in the pre, when the Mongols were still in the deserts, the Gobi Desert, uh, the chieftains would collect like 1% of the uh, Mongols' herds. So if you had 100 sheep, one sheep per year would be given uh, to the uh, chieftain families as a form of taxation. That sometimes was the tax that people paid once the Mongols took over. But there were also other forms of taxes, and <clears throat> we seem to have evidence that the Mongols sought to charge like a 5% tax on commercial transactions, but as far as property tax went, sometimes it was closer to that 1%, which involved taking like one out of every 100 animals from the people's uh, herds. So that's just an example, and, and this is interesting. If you think about it, the Mongols were not all that great in number, so one of the benefits of this Darugachi institution was that you didn't have to leave many Mongol people behind to control an area. You just left one, and of course the Mongols as a whole were well feared, so that one person could actually administer rather effectively 
Uh, no one wanted the Mongols to return and make life difficult for them. So one of the benefits of this system, the Darugachi system, was that now uh, the Mongols can continue to move on and conquer their next place, and they don't have to leave large numbers of the Mongol people um, behind to hold and administrate an area. Here we have a brief family tree. <clears throat> you see there Genghis Khan on top. He dies in 1227. There's a brief succession feud, but as I mentioned in class, Ogade, one of his four sons, is going to become the clear and true um, uh, ruler uh, of the Mongols uh, over much of the coming decades. But suddenly in 1241, as I mentioned in class, he dies, and that actually is a major, um, that very much derails the uh, progress that the Mongols had been making as they were seeking to expand farther west. And so the death of Ogade really, no one knew it at the time, but it's going to spell the westward limit of Mongol expansion. And then down here you can see uh, grandson Kubla, who will be Kubla Khan, uh, he is going to become the leader of the Yuan Empire, or the Mongol Empire, in China. And that helps you kind of see that <clears throat> family family uh, relationship. So during Ogade's reign, I just want to point out a couple things. There are some other institutions that are implemented. One of the things that made the Mongols quite successful was their very effective communication system. Those of you who've studied sort of classic era uh, uh, American civilization, this is sort of reminiscent of the Inca in the footpath system that they had. But this postal relay system was kind of like the Pony Express, and the Mongols were able to communicate very quickly and across the vast realm that they controlled through this postal relay system. And essentially what it entailed was uh, a system of roads that had stops roughly every 30 miles. And at those stops, the uh, delivery or messengers, they could refresh, they could get a fresh mount, so a new animal, horse to ride. Uh, they could um, get a new messenger if they needed to. But it kept the pace and speed of communication at a fairly high and fast uh, rate. And the way they would do this is that to make sure that your message was legitimate, those official um, communications would take place on a bronze or silver tablet, which was essentially like the seal of the king, so to speak, and it gave immediate legitimacy to whatever the person who carried that tablet um, had to say. So this really helped. Um, other things that served the Mongols well was that when they took over new places, they oftentimes looked at the craftsmen and the skills of the people that they were conquering. And if there was something that looked like it could be of value or use, they would adopt that and essentially make those people their slaves, but essentially they would be high-level slaves. They would continue to practice their craft, and this is a way that the Mongols could adapt greater sophistication. Bear in mind, they, they really weren't a civilization but they could adopt some of the um, skills and accomplishments of civilization through this process. And this also helped the Mongols make <clears throat> foreign skills their own, and that was very useful. Also, they're going to use Central Asian merchants. This is quite fascinating. Um, the Mongols understood, I guess, their limits. They knew that being a nomadic and uncivilized society meant that if they were going to go places, they would have to sort of get with it. And one of the ways they did this is essentially their economy was based on plunder, right? They're invading new places. They are um, destroying people, but pillaging and taking their things. Um, but they needed ways to convert that into wealth. Uh, they took the essentially stolen merchandise or the stolen goods that they encountered by taking over people. And then they would have a certain class of merchants convert those stolen goods into profits through their sale. So it was like they had this great sort of like eBay or Craigslist where they could convert their stuff into money and wealth 
and uh, they relied on Central Asian merchants to use this. So fairly, really interesting business uh, strategy or business plan that they practiced. Okay, so finally when um, Kublai Khan comes into power and takes over, um, you know, essentially proceeds into Central and Southern China, the type of government that he's going to establish is an interesting one. He is, as a Mongol, suspicious of outside culture and cultural influences. So one of the ways that the Mongols, particularly Kublai Khan, offset and try to make their governmental system more trustworthy is through diarchy. And diarchy refers to, at any chance they had, the Chinese Mongols or the Mongols in China tried to pair government officials. So they would keep a Chinese or a Han government official in place, but they would pair with them a Mongol um, government official. So the idea here was that you keep the foreigners honest by having a native or a Mongol, someone familiar to you, uh, who would shadow them. And diarchy was one part of that. The As you can imagine, this wouldn't work very well with the civil service exam. So the civil service exam will be tabled now for a while. It will make a return kind of in the late Yuan dynasty, but early on un under Kubla, it's not going to be practiced. We know the Mongols tried, as I mentioned in class. They tried, but were unsuccessful in their invasions of Japan. On two separate occasions, they're going to be discouraged and dismantled um, by uh, weather and the term kamikaze, which means divine wind in Japan is a very commonly quoted uh, explanation for why the Mongols will be unsuccessful. Uh, so as though the, the wind smiled upon Japan and blessed its destiny by discouraging the efforts of the outside Mongols to successfully invade Japan. Okay. Um, in 1294 Kublai will die and in the remaining decades of Mongol rule they will face a series of hardships and um, a continuing decline in their influence. Part of this is due to the fact that the Mongol business plan had always relied upon more and more space and more and more enemies to conquer. And by the late 13th century, there's just not that room to grow. In fact, in China, the Mongols are sort of hemmed in by their own Mongols who have taken over and been successful in places farther west. So this is part of the problem. Also, China will be racked by famine and disease. And the taxation systems that were put in place by the Mongols uh, are not capable of um, you know, maintaining their pace because they are being, um, the population of China itself is shrinking. And uh, this also raises some anger and frustration that the Chinese people had based on the fact that these Mongol people are in fact foreigners. So there are going to be a number of sort of nativist uprisings. Some of them are over taxes. Some of them are over the declining morals and discipline of the ruling Mongol emperors. Uh, and this finally is going to give way by the late 14th century in 1368 a series of peasant rebellions will um, emerge and along with them a new dynasty. So the Mongols are short-lived but powerful. They transform not just China but large parts uh, of the world and uh, China will have a large um, challenge, a tall challenge to rebuild and reestablish itself following the, the um, ultimate end of the Mongol dynasty. All right, there you have it, and we will um, pick up on Tuesday with our last day of focusing on China. Take care.